Cool. Uh, probably unsurprisingly, uh, I'm going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons uh, and why I feel like you should care about it and probably play it as well. Uh, and I will be your dungeon master on this adventure into role playing. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. <laughs> All right. What is Dungeons and Dragons? Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is a fantasy role playing game that was uh, created in 1974 by a guy named Gary Gygax. Uh, I'm going to skip over most of Gary Gygax uh, because he is kind of a problematic character uh, in his own right. Uh, his family is kind of problematic and just generally um, we can just skip that. But he did create uh, Dungeons and Dragons. We're going to give him credit for that. Um, he, we'll get into how he created it a little bit too. Um, but originally, Dungeons and Dragons was built uh, based on wargaming. And in wargaming, you uh, it's, you know you create these huge armies uh, that fight someone else's huge army and usually use uh, miniatures to represent units and things. And you, it takes up a lot of space. It's a big, huge white person investment because it it's a lot of money. Um, and he wanted to sort of take that idea and bring it down to a smaller scale and instead uh, tell a story about a team of adventurers going on quests. Originally, it was really like it, like the term hack and slash uh, was representative of what Dungeons and Dragons was at the time. It was like you go into it was Dungeons and Dragons. You go into a dungeon, you fight a bunch of things, you get treasure, you take that treasure and you use it in the next dungeon, rinse, repeat. Um he, uh, as it expanded a little bit, uh, became a little bit more narrative in form. Uh, it leaned, started to lean more and more on existing fantasy fiction at the time. Um, he pulled things verbatim out of other uh, authors' works, uh, notably uh, Tolkien's Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings books. Um, in the original versions of Dungeons and Dragons, there were uh, one of the races that you could play as was a hobbit that obviously needed to be changed. Uh, and there were entities known as uh, Ents, uh, which were then changed to tree ants. Um, and, and there were just things that were just lifted wholesale from, from other works of fiction. Um, uh, the Tolkien estate actually forced him to change hobbits and, and, and anything else that was uh, um, representative of Tolkien's works. I think orcs uh, stayed because orcs were um, considered generic enough and existed in other mythologies and fictions that those stayed in Dungeons and Dragons. But other things like the Hobbits became halflings, Ents became trans, uh, things like that. Um, do, 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 where is my cursor? Okay, there we go. Um, role playing, uh, what is role playing? So, a role playing game is any game wherein you play as a character uh, in a story that is being told collectively. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is not the only role playing game, but it's probably the oldest and best known. Um, I can't tell any story about uh, sort of the history of Dungeons and Dragons without mentioning a little bit uh, Satanic Panic. So um, there were a number of disappearances and suicides during the 80s. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on in the 80s. Uh, um, and those things led to what is now known as Satanic Panic. Uh, basically, the... Um, there were a number of kids that had played or had friends that played Dungeons and Dragons that had disappeared or whatever uh, because of because Dungeons and Dragons includes uh, monsters such as demons and devils and there's magic. Uh, there is paranoia about witchcraft in general. Um, parents freaked out, uh, blamed Dungeons and Dragons as well as many other things, including heavy metal, uh, for all of the world's society's badness. And it was really led by these two people. Uh, and since their deaths, it was uh, the, I think it's I think pretty sure it's the two people that are named in this poster, Mary Dempsey and Pat Dempsey. And since uh, since Mary Dempsey um, has is deceased um the whole concept of dungeons and dragons being bad at all has disappeared with her so it's literally a movement that was created by this person and has not survived um but uh during that time it led to the game being pushed into the shadows into basements and it hurt the popularity of the game in the general public i actually just read a twitter thread by a uh tabletop RPG creator um, uh, who built a game called Zweihander. And uh, he was just, uh, he was talking about a Bob's Burgers episode in which they were playing uh, a role-playing game. And the fact that the way that it was framed in, in the episode was so normal, it wasn't about how people were weird. It wasn't about how uh, like they were freaks. It was just, it was just 
this is a thing that was cool and they were talking about it and he personally it resonated so much for him he said he he almost uh he almost teared up because he could remember hiding his uh his player's handbook and monster manual under the bed like they were porn um and that's and so the legacy of that is still uh is still sort of stands today um Today, uh, Dungeons & Dragons is known as the world's most popular role-playing game. It's pretty much a self, uh, self-declared self marketing gimmick. Uh, whether or not it's actually true, it's definitely the most well-known. Um, it's been featured in lots of TV shows, uh, like Big Bang Theory, Freaks and Geeks, Stranger Things, um, and has become a lot more commonplace. And when uh, t- there was Twitch data uh, that was leaked uh, earlier this year, um, it was revealed that Critical Role, which is a very popular uh, role-playing uh, group, uh, company, um, they stream their game. They've been streaming for, I think, five-ish years, I guess. Um, they, they, it was revealed that not only were they the most uh, earning the most revenue on Twitch at all, uh, but also that they earned over 9 million. In fact, it might even be like 12 million. I don't remember the numbers, but it was in the millions of dollars just from last year alone from their Twitch stream. That doesn't include YouTube uh, revenue. It doesn't include merch or advertising or partnerships. They just released a book a couple of weeks ago. They've got officially published content. Um, they've got a lot of stuff. So that one revenue stream uh, earned them in the millions of dollars. So obviously Dungeons and Dragons is kind of a big deal now. Uh, and it's, it's way super mainstream now. So how do you play? Uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, there's two main roles. There is the dungeon master or the DM and players. The dungeon master or the DM uh, frames the story, is sort of the arbiter of the rules and gives players uh, scenarios to act out. Uh, the players navigate within that world the DM has created, making choices and taking actions the DM needs to respond and react to. Uh, the DM uh, takes on the role of like the entire world that surrounds the characters, sometimes having to come up with scenarios, locations, and non-player characters or NPCs on the fly. And then the players uh, will react to that world and often will act or describe their actions as their characters. I fire an arrow at that goblin, or I say this to the tavern keeper. Uh, Player characters have a set of stats that determine how good they are at things. Usually those are uh, rolled at the beginning in character creation to, to, you know, you roll for your stats and then you apply them where you want based on the type of character you want to play. Dice are rolled in general to just add an element of chaos and chance to encounters. Uh, And then modifiers are added or subtracted from those dice rolls based on your stats. Uh, Anytime there is any sort of outcome that might be uncertain, Uh, whether it's because you're attacking a foe or because you're trying to persuade the barkeep to give you some information you need, that's when you want to bring in the dice. Uh, In D&D, the majority of your dice rolls are on a D20 or a 20-sided die. Uh, Occasionally, other dice will be brought in. A dungeon master might roll on different dice uh, based on charts or tables that they have prepared or find in published materials, um, or players or the DM might use other dice to determine damage of various weapons or spells. Um, there's hundreds of books pub- uh, published D&D adventures, uh, settings, optional content, and rules, but you don't need all of them. Um, you can play in an established setting. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons has several official ones, or you can make stuff up and play in a completely homebrew setting. Uh, the campaign that I am running currently uh, takes place in the world of Exandria, which is the world of Critical Role that was created by Matt Mercer, and that's kind of technically both. Uh, it was a homebrew setting originally for him that now has officially published content. Uh, and the way that I run it is I like to kind of uh, have a hodgepodge of everything. I just pull content in from all over the place um, and, and just kind of mix it all together and, and see what happens because uh, that's my jam. Uh, stories in role-playing games uh, are typically broken into campaigns. So a campaign tells the story of a particular group of adventurers. Within that campaign, there might be many story arcs that include multiple individual adventures. An adventure is sort of, uh, you know, a series of sessions that lead to some sort of accomplishing of a task or something. Um, You could uh, join together multiple campaigns to tell the overarching story of a world or a particular setting, if that's your thing. Um, And shorter campaigns, anywhere from one to like four or five or six sessions uh, are generally called one shots. Um, And those usually focus on a particular adventure or uh, objective for the, for the team of of adventurers. 
Uh, ultimately, the DM is in charge of coming up with the world that the player characters interact in, but there should be uh, some input from the players before and possibly during a campaign. Uh, one thing that's becoming more and more popular uh, is running a session zero, which is you get together before the campaign actually starts. Uh, you talk about goals, you, you try to get uh, gauge people's interests and the types of the stories and things that they are interested in, and you maybe lay some ground rules, uh, particularly around safety and um, uh, content that uh, might be triggering to some people just to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that there are tools in place uh, to to sort of bail out if things get uh, into territory that people that would be uncomfortable for people. Um, d and in particular talks about the three pillars of storytelling. Uh, there's exploration, which is uh, discovering new things, exploring places, and generally learning about this world that the DM uh, has created. Uh, there is social, uh, which is interacting with the people and uh, the world and their customs and, and events, and combat, which is fighting against literal or metaphorical monsters. Uh, most D&D games will have some combination of those three pillars, uh, and the specific ratio of each might depend on the group itself and the things that were discussed in that session zero. All right, so why does any of this matter? Uh, side note, this is Tasha. Uh, she has spells named after her, uh, most notably Tasha's Hideous Laughter. I love this picture and I love this character and I'm glad that she has her own book now uh, because uh, powerful women in uh, fiction and fantasy fiction is just awesome. She's, she's my favorite thing. Uh, all right, there's a bunch of reasons why I feel like role-playing in general and possibly Dungeons and Dragons in particular is important. Uh, in most of these, Dungeons and Dragons is just a placeholder. It's the common ground. Uh, anything that I talk about here pretty much applies to other role-playing games as well. All right, role-playing is a great way to build empathy. Uh, I've witnessed firsthand in my players, which is largely my kids and their friends, uh, working things out and learning how to deal with the world and people through role-playing. I've heard comments about uh, and seeing how much better kids are uh, about do working through interpersonal problems when they do come up. Uh, role-playing is frequently used as a tool in therapy and team building and Dungeons and Dragons is the same as any other kind of role-playing. Um, and I think that part of critical role success as a company, kind of circling back to that, and something that they've actually cited too, is the result of having played Dungeons and Dragons together for so long, learning what each other's strengths and weaknesses are and how to work together as a team toward a common goal. Uh, Role-playing is a great way to experiment with identity, things like gender, gender identity and uh, sexual orientation, cultural identi identity and beliefs, and all sorts of things that are different from your own in a hopefully uh, safe environment. If you uh, don't have a safe environment to explore those things, then find yourself another group because that group sucks. Um, there is very little risk involved in playing a character with a different gender identity or sexual orientation than you, uh, and doing so can, again, uh, go back to the empathy thing, help build empathy for people in marginalized groups or just people that are uh, whose background is different from your own. Role-playing fills a much needed avenue for escapism. Uh, speaking personally, uh, when COVID started, uh, we had been running a weekly Dungeons and Dragons campaign, uh, which we canceled until things ran their course in quotations, uh, which obviously that didn't work out so well. Uh, and very quickly, I realized that I needed an outlet for creativity in order to be okay in this new, terrifying world with rapidly changing news about the virus. Um, so I started a small campaign just within the family, uh, the four of us. And after some time, I started running an online campaign um, with a lot of the people that were in the, our, our you know, in-person group. So for a while, I was running two campaigns concurrently. And I realized... Uh, after doing that, how important D&D was and had become for me and how I really looked forward to and needed those games just as a way to think about other things and tell a, a fantasy story for a while. Um, especially in these trying times, uh, the need for escapism is huge and Dungeons and Dragons and R RPGs really fill that niche. Uh, and Dungeons and Dragons and role playing in general uh, give you an opportunity to hang out. Uh, either in person or virtually or in chat rooms uh, with other people that have similar ideas and in interests. Uh, as an extrovert, I suffer a lot when I'm not able to hang out with people. And this is a big part of 2020. Uh, being able to get together now uh, with uh, vaccinated players in my home game has been huge. Uh, but even just running the game online provided an opportunity to do something fun uh, with other human beings. Um, I've also found and joined a number of Discord channels and virtually met folks who have a similar interest that way. Um, role-playing games provide an easy in 
to meet new people. Uh, in the WordPress community, we have meetups and WordCamps, uh, but if these things didn't exist and they haven't for the last little while, um, I would have little exposure to other human beings in real life. On the other hand, I know that because I'm part of these communities, um, if I wanted to join an RPG group, um, I could find many people in my area who are playing, what they're playing, the types of games that they're interested in doing. And that, and it provides an easy icebreaker into interacting with and meeting other actual adult humans that I would, might not have otherwise. So go out and play some games. Uh, there is very little that you need to start playing role-playing games. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is not the only thing, uh, and it's maybe not even the best thing. There are any number of one-page RPGs uh, made by the TTRPG community that can be played as one-shots if you want to just dip your feet in. Um, there are starter kits available. Uh, this one that is on the screen, it's one of them. Um, uh, they're both free or otherwise uh, for most popular uh, role-playing games. And you can Google to find different games uh, that might fit what you're trying to get out of it, whether it's a hack and slash dungeon crawl, uh, an intense emo exploration into personal darkness, a descent into Lovecraftian madness, a super high-tech futuristic dystopia, or a Monster of the Week style episodic tale similar to Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Supernatural. Uh, some examples of non-Dungeons & Dragons games uh, that are popular are Call of Cthulhu, Apocalypse World, Monster Hearts, uh, Honey Heist, the Quiet Ear, Microscope, and Vampire the Masquerade, and other World of Darkness games. And uh, kids can play too. Um, there's variations of rules for younger kids uh, that exist for many systems, or you can just throw the rules out the window uh, and play simply by creating some sort of a framework using yes and, and just collaboratively telling stories together. Um, there's a great Twitter thread or Twitter account um, that uh, I will share somewhere uh because i can't remember off the top of my head but the dude um it's a dad and he and he mostly tweets and has an instagram account wherein he uh gets ideas from his four-year-old dungeon master so it's like um uh, conversations with the four-year-old dungeon master uh and um so he'll like post a uh, four-year-old dungeon master uh dm tips or player tips or all sorts of things and it's it's great and it and when he talks about it he talks about like how um like how that sort of came to be and really like they're they they're it sounds like uh, they're kind of sort of playing Dungeons and Dragons almost perpetually um, and just without dice and sometimes with dice. I mean, I think they do sit down and do it, um, but I think a lot of the times it's just, you know, yes and, and, you know, playing in this, this persistent world, um, even when it's not like a sit down, get together time to play D&D. &D, and I think that's awesome. Uh, the kids do this stuff all the time already. So we're just playing their games. Um, Definitely uh, report back when you've played because I would love to hear about your experiences or explore role-playing together. Um, and then we've got a whole bunch of resources uh, that I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, the first one on the list is the TTRPG Safety Toolkit. Uh, this is a group of, a collection of tools um, and ideas that you could bring into your session zero or things that you could play, use throughout the, the, uh, the game where to, to, um, either to set the ground rules again uh, and to have uh, opportunities for players to kind of bail out of things or to fade to black to things. There are things like, um, uh, there's an N card, there's one, one ses uh, system where it's like the N card, the O card and the X card, um, uh, O is okay. N is like, this is getting iffy and uh, X card is like, nope, we need to fade to black now. Um, and those are things that somebody could like, if, you, if they're physical cards, you could actually like have a thing and raise it during the game. And then you would know, the DM would know, or the, the storyteller or whatever, the you know, game master in that system would know that that's, that's uh, time to do whatever uh, and, and act accordingly. Um, there is this really cool sort of flow chart like uh, document uh, called, So You Want to Play Dungeons and Dragons, uh, which uh, it comes at it from the angle of, so you've heard about Dungeons and Dragons and you think it's really cool and you want to play Dungeons and Dragons is probably not the game that you want to play. And so it, it, it goes through a process of figuring out the things that you're most interested in and points you to other games that might do that thing better. Um, so it's a really cool way of learning about other systems that are out there that aren't Dungeons and Dragons. Because again, it's not necessarily the best thing. It's just the thing that everybody knows. Um, I found this list of one page RPGs. I was really trying to find just like 
a place where all the one page RPGs existed. And so I found this like uh, online game shop thing. Most of them you can download for free or, but that was sort of just a collection of a whole bunch of them that I recognized. And so I just threw that out there. Um, if you do a Google search for like one page RPGs, you'll find a whole bunch of stuff. The notable ones that I know and like are uh, Honey Heist and uh, Crash Pandas. Um, and if you kind of branch off from there to find things that are like that, you'll find a whole bunch of wacky stuff. Uh, there's a Dungeon Dragon starter cat starter set, uh, which is obviously uh, sold by Dun uh, Wizards of the Coast. Uh, and there are monster slayers. So uh, these are the Dungeons and Dragons rules that have been pared down and scaled for kids specifically. Um, uh, the one that I used and was familiar with is Heroes of Hesiod, uh, which is now available on DMs Guild. That was the first one that they did. The current one is called Champions of the Elements, uh, which I'm less familiar with. And uh, um, uh, yeah, don't, but, but both of them, and that's the one that you can get on the actual Wizards of the Coast website now. Um, and both of them just, uh, again, they do pare down the rules, make it a little bit easier in, uh, to, for, for kids to get into the idea of role-playing. They've got really cute uh, illustrations and um, yeah, they're kind of neat. So uh, that is, uh, that's all I got. And may all your rules be 20. Uh, I'll stop sharing now. And y'all can ask me questions if you have them. Yes. Oh, yeah, I need to do that first. Cool. Um, that's, that's, uh, that is our first Bin Jazz Conf. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah, I've got an answer. When, when you start, first started playing, um, who who is dungeon master for for you? Okay, so my entrance into role playing is uh, a very meandering journey. Um, I first learned about Dungeons and Dragons in like middle school um, because I was spending all of my time and money at a comic book stop shop that was close to uh, where my parents' apartment was, uh, and they had happened to have one of the original. Not the first red box version, but like one of the original versions of the first edition of um, Dungeons and Dragons. And then I and then so I got that. And then I also got like an advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which I didn't realize was a different thing at the time. Uh, player's handbook. And I tried to like mash the two together sort of. Um, and then I got interested. They, they had a, a box set for Dark Sun and that like set me off. But I didn't have anybody to play with. Um, there was... Um, someone who also was interested in, in role-playing games who came into the shop that I hung out with a little bit and he played games like um, uh, Battletech and uh, Marvel superheroes. Uh, and so I played those with him and he kind of, he was a few years older and he sort of like ran those things, but they weren't like campaigns. It was just like, you know, here's a thing you've got your guy over here and I've got my guy over here and we just fight. Um, Later uh, in high school, I started getting interested in Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, again, like I was super interested in the lore and the books, didn't have anyone to play with. Uh, I think I went to a LARP, uh, a vampire LARP once, and it was awful because it was totally unorganized. Um, so again, didn't really have anything. But in high school, I did have a group of friends and we role played just generally without rules, just hung out and role played in parks and things. Um, and that was sort of my, I would say, first foray into role playing in general, even though we didn't have a system, we were, you know, telling stories, we had persistent characters that changed and evolved over time. And there's a kind of a persistent story that was kind of being woven, mostly by um, one person, uh, we were all just kind of playing inside of his imagination, I think. It wasn't until college, uh, when I played a long standing game, uh, last about, well, lasted for most of the time that I was there of Mage the Ascension that um, I actually would consider myself a player uh, that actually had a, in a, in a game that actually had a, a storyteller or, or a game master. Um, so, uh, I'll, and that was, um, yeah, so that would be sort of the first, um, the first dungeon master. When I came to D&D, &D, uh, which is, I mean, really just more recently, like I, I got books and I, I wanted to introduce the kids to it at some point when they were younger. Um, and so I started kind of venturing into it a little bit uh, at a time. Um, 
kind of like in between like the 3.5 and and fourth edition um of D, uh where like things like i had some stuff that was from, from conflicting editions uh that didn't really fit together um but i was trying to just like mash things together um but i didn't we didn't really do anything until uh you know the last couple of years and went primarily because the kids were trying to do D D at like um libraries and things and the those games were not particularly well run um and kind of chaotic and i wanted to like they wanted to, to run their own games and i was like okay that's great but in order to run a game you kind of need to know what a really good game feels like so and it wasn't going to happen no one else was going to do it so we decided to just do it um and that was when i started digging into to uh fifth edition uh, dungeons and dragons and and really starting to um learn about stuff and started listening to critical role uh and um yeah so like my first and probably kind of only uh game master was still that one uh that one game that i, I played in for a couple of years in, in college so that was uh mage the ascension 